Hi, everybody. Uh, so nice to be with you here on this uh, um, slightly damp and, and rainy um, fall afternoon. And what, we're, what I want to talk to you today about is food literacy. And what I mean by food literacy is the ability to actually be able to discuss food in a rational way, to know most of the base, basic facts about our food system, um, to be able to understand the challenges and the paradigms that, that we face in trying to feed a hungry planet. So it's a, it's a pretty simple concept. But I think what you'll find as we go through this, that food literacy itself is, is actually very, very rare in our societies. Now, one thing about eating, eating is something we all take very seriously. It's something we do three times a day. It's something we've got very, very strong opinions on. And goodness me, if you ever see somebody who's very hungry, stay out of their way because they're probably going to be in a very crabby mood. So food and eating, these are not trivial concerns. Um, and in the food space, there's so much intense noise out there. There are so many people firing this opinion and that opinion. There's so much research, a lot of it contradictory. It can be really, really difficult to know what's true or what's not true, what's up or what's down. This is a very, very complicated space. And to make matters worse, we've kind of lost our connection with the land. In the Middle Ages, about 95% of us actually worked on the land. Today in the US, it's down to about 2%. So most of us, when we're expounding our opinions on food, what you'll find is we don't really have any practical personal experience. We're really spouting off other people's opinions and how we've internalized them. That makes us, for the most part, food illiterate. But even though we're food, food illiterate, we still have a religious fervor in the way we talk about food. We don't just have opinions. We have really, really strong opinions. And, and when you try to challenge somebody's opinions on food, they get all riled up. And you can see veins popping out of their necks. It's, don't challenge my opinions on food. I, I believe those things with, with, a, with, a, with a, a true religious fervor. Because of that, we're foodies. We post pictures of food up on, up on the internet. I had to post this picture a couple of weeks ago because my son's mom was, are you feeding our son right? Are you giving him a good dinner? I'm like, look, it's a healthy dinner, lots of vegetables. We post pictures of food on the web all the time. And we like our memes. We post lots of memes on, 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 on social media. You know, I found out by reading this meme that if I just eat enough dragon fruit, enough nanny, and enough soursop, I probably won't get cancer. But I've got absolutely no idea what dragon fruit, soursop, or nanny are, but it's still, it's a, it's, it's a great meme. Um, some memes are a little bit more inflammatory. Veggie burger gone bad. Wow, that's, that's a pretty scary one. And some are darn right, like, truly inflammatory. Like, eating organic is like giving Monsanto the finger. <laughs> These things don't necessarily help our food literacy. It's great to fire an opinion off, but we're constantly being bombarded by messaging all the time. Some of it true, some of it erroneous, some of it fact-based, some of it not. So through all that mass of information, two truths have emerged to me, two simple truths. The first is that our food system is really complex. And you can't really talk about it very easily in a quick meme or a quick soundbite. And the second is that overall, food literacy is extremely low, even in policymakers, even in people who are making decisions as to what our food supply will be. Most of them don't really know what they're talking about, which is kind of scary. So I want to start at the very, very beginning. And I, I know that many of you will already know the basis of the food story. But just in case people don't, I want to go through it because it's very, very important for what we'll build upon. So one of our main problems, and probably the biggest problem of, of overall, is we've got a growing population. You know, but back in 8,000 BC, we only had 5 million people on Earth. So when we started to first cultivate agriculture and stop being hunter, hunters and gatherers, we only had about 5 million people to feed. By the time of Christ, it was about 250 million people, so quite a huge jump. By 1500 AD, 500 million people. By 1800, it had doubled to a billion. Then it doubled in 125 years to 2 billion in 1925. In 1965, when I was born, world's population 3.5 billion. Today, it's 7 billion. And very soon, it'll be 9 billion. So this same planet that only had to feed 5 million people back in 8,000 BC is now going to have to feed 9 billion. So how are we doing in our overall quest to feed our current 7 billion plus 2 billion more soon to come? So let's look at a basic scorecard. Well, we've got 1 billion undernourished. We've got 1 billion overnourished. We've got 5 billion that are adequate. And we've got 2 billion coming soon. 
So this is very, very much an incomplete. And the one billion undernourished and one billion overnourished are not good signs, especially when we've got two billion more people to accommodate. To make matters worse, it's not just about all these mouths. We also have this new exploding middle class to contend with. And when people move from being poor to the middle class, they want to consume higher, higher value proteins. Now, typically, one pound of grain equals one pound of food, but not when it comes to meat. Because chicken, one pound of chicken takes three pounds of, of, of grain uh, uh, or, or food to produce. Pork, five pounds. And beef, seven pounds. So as we, meet, as we eat more meat, and as the growing middle class eats more meat, our demand for food increases beyond just the extra two billion people. In short, we have to double our food supply in the next 40 years. And to put that into perspective, what that means is we have to grow as much food in the next 40 years as we have done in the last 10,000 combined. Now, over that 10,000 years, we've had all of those summers and winters and springs and falls and all those seasons for our land and soils to adjust and replenish themselves. Now we don't. Now we're going to be very, very taxed, and we're, we're going to put a lot of strain on our ecosystems in feeding these extra 2 billion people. So let's look at the planet and see what we have to work with. What kind of land mass do we have to work with to feed these 9 billion? Well, you know we're 70% water. You know, 15% is desert and, and, and polar areas, and we're not going to grow any food there. 3% is urban. We've got about 8% of what we'd call low quality or potentially unproductive land, mountains, forests, or places where the soils are just so poor you can't grow anything, or there's no water available, or it's too hot, or it's too cold. So in the end, you only end up with about 4% of our, of our total planetary mass can actually be used to grow food. That's not very much. Now, we can't just grab more land. We can't just deforest. If we deforest, we're going to we're going to destroy so many very, very valuable eco ecosystems. And we need those forests to sequester carbon anyway. So deforestation on a mass scale is just not an option. To make matters worse, we're losing land. In the US alone, we lose about a million acres of farmland each year. And that's because suburbs and exurbs, as, they, as we expand out, out in cities and, and widen our footprint, we're mostly taking over vegetable plots and small areas of farmland that used, used to surround and feed cities. So we're losing what little land we have. Now, there is the factor of food waste. And a lot of people will point and say, well, it's not that bad, because we, we lose 40% of our food through waste. Some of it rots in the fields, some of it rots in the storage bins, some in transportation to market, some in processing, some in my fridge at home, some when I cook too much food and think I'm going to have leftovers, but then don't eat them and I throw them away. And we can make massive inroads into this 40%. But you can't stop all food waste. Some of it is just going to continue because food itself is naturally perishable. In spite of all of those challenges, there are even some more challenges we're going to have to factor in as we try to figure out how to feed 9 billion people. The first is we've already been working our soils and this planet really hard to feed the 7 billion or the 5 billion before that. Our soils are tired. And in many places, we've been simply taking more nutrients out of the soil than we've been putting back in. Quite frankly, even among the 4% of, of, of land we actually have to use uh, on this planet, for, or, that, or that's available for crops, quite a bit of it is already degraded. We also have low farmer competencies. Uh, quite frankly, around the world, small farmers in, in developing nations are not very good farmers in many ways. Some of them don't even know how to grow food in, in rows. Or, or tightly pack seeds. I've seen farmers just take a handful of seed and throw it to the wind. And you'll see here, here's a, here's a field in, in, in Guatemala. Th th this is a, a pretty typical cornfield down there. You'll see it's completely covered in weeds. There's hardly any coverage of the plant itself. This land is not going to yield very much food. Even if we could teach farmers in, 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 in developing nations, some of these small farmers, of which there are about half a billion of them in the world, and about another two billion people relying on them for income in their families and children, et cetera, even if we could improve, there's no infrastructure to get that food to market. There's no roads, there's no transportation systems, deep water ports, et cetera. We also have severe economic issues, macroeconomic issues, around markets and barriers and free trade. When we had a food crisis in 2008, we had plenty of food to go around, but countries that had traditionally experienced famine were like, no way, I'm not letting this food out. We couldn't get food from A to B. 
So market barriers and, and government and political action, that can be very, very difficult to change and move. We also have global social issues, because when you talk about food and feeding people, it's not an issue that exists on its own. You're touching on poverty, you're touching on access to capital, human rights, women's and children's rights, land rights. These all complicate any potential solutions. We also have the ever so small issue of water. Water is finite. We only have a certain number of water molecules in the atmosphere. And the, oh, we are already projecting that, uh, uh, just looking at current demand levels, by about 2030, we're going to have about a 30% shortfall between supply and demand of water. You can't grow food without water. And then we've got the little thing called climate change. Climate change is a farmer's worst nightmare. Because what it does is it's probably going to make some places drier and some places wetter. Farmers like, don't, don't like things too dry and don't like things too wet. Drought and flood are a farmer's worst enemies. So climate change is a big unknown here. We know places are going to be dry. We know places are going to be wet. But we're not exactly sure where and when. So when you look at all that there together, throwing a meme up on, up on Facebook and being the all authority on food, no, we just got to do this and everything will be OK, it kind of seems a little silly, doesn't it? But it still doesn't stop people from doing it. And that's how most of the information is getting out there. So how do we begin to create food literacy? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But one of the biggest issues that I see is that even if you have all the information, sometimes when you look at paradigms, what seems to make sense doesn't end up making sense. So the eat locally, think globally is a mantra for a lot of people. But does it really work? So a study was done of the, of the US. And I, I call it the locavores dilemma. Because although on the surface, yeah, making all, growing all your food really close to where you live and shipping it in seems like a great idea. So, this study was done just in the US. And it's a simple paradigm. Could every state feed itself? So states were not allowed trade in food. Each state had to produce enough food for its own citizens. So it's not taking a global paradigm, which would be very, very difficult to model, just the US. And here's what the model said. If we were to do that, we would need an additional 60 million acres of cropland, 50 million pounds of farm chemicals like herbicides and pesticides and fungicides, and 2.7 extra million tons of fertilizer per year in the US alone if we were to go to that model. Because the truth of the matter is the most efficient way to grow food is to grow it where it grows well and then transport it very, very efficiently. Because 85% of the environmental impact is going to occur in growing the food and only about 15% in transportation. So in the locavore movement, yes, you save that 15%, but you massively increase the 85%. So things are just not as they seem. Here's another one, farmers markets. What could be wrong with a farmers market? Everybody loves farmers markets. And I'm not going to diss farmers markets, because I love them too. But there are some hidden costs in farmers markets that you don't see. So for example, the average person is only willing to drive 1.5 miles to the grocery store. Um, but they're willing to drive 10 miles to a farmer's market. That's 10 miles there and back. They probably can't get all of their food at a, at a grocery store, or I mean at, at a farmer's market. They're probably going to have to go to the grocery store in addition to that. So you basically have this extra 20-mile trip. That's a large carbon footprint when you begin to think of everybody going to farmer's markets. So even, even something as pure and as good as a farmer's market can have externalities which are not easy to factor in. So now I want to talk about fertilizer and organic fertilizer versus mineral fertilizer. Because you see a lot of things on the web about this. And the general assumption is that organic fertilizer is good and mineral fertilizer, or as we call it in the industry, crop nutrients, is bad. And when we talk about organic fertilizer, we use words like natural and manure and compost. And they're words that, that, that people like. Natural, you just put natural on a food stuff, you can charge more for it. Put organic and natural, you can charge a lot more for it. So these are powerful branding words. Now, when we talk about mineral fertilizers, the words that are used out there are synthetic, chemical, artificial, man-made. These are not words that are going to get you a premium for your product in today's, in today's markets. These are negative. They may be accurate to a certain extent, but it's very, very interesting to see that just the language we use to talk about these two different kinds of fertilizer is very, very different, and branding matters. So let's look at these two things and see, are they really that different? 
Now, both have the same active plant foods. Whether fertilizer is mineral or whether fertilizer is, is organic, it's really more or less the same stuff. You know, it's got basic elements. It's got nitrogen. So you, you'll all remember from your table of elements, nitrogen, you know, uh, um, and helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, or nitrogen being number seven, you know, phosphorus being number 15, potassium being number 19. All the other basic micronutrients like boron and calcium and magnesium, all these foods that plants need, they're all in, in organic fertilizer and in, and in mineral fertilizer. There's a very, very big difference in concentration. Typical organic fertilizers are 1.5% to 2% active, whereas mineral fertilizers are very, very concentrated. They're about 60% active, but they are the same chemical compounds. And in this picture here, you'll see a, a potash mine in Saskatchewan. Um, th those big lines on the wall are made from the, the, the actual miner um, and extracting the potassium from the wall, which is then basically crushed, washed, put into granules, and shipped. It's a pretty simple process. And when you look at something like potassium, it's really difficult for me to say, like, is that really man-made? Yeah, it's man-produced, but is it really man-made? I'm not sure that's a very, very accurate word for it. Nitrogen, of all the nutrients, is probably the most man-made because it doesn't occur in natural form. It occurs as a, ga as a gas. And you've got to solidify that to get it in the field. And how they do that is they supercharge air with, with, with heat, mostly using natural gas as a feedstock. And that is quite a chemical process, so I can see why you would call nitrogen synthetic. But phosphorus, you know, magnesium, boron, potassium, all the others, I'm not sure I would. And what I've noticed in, when people talk about fertilizer on the web, they use the word fertilizer and then they just talk about nitrogen. But nitrogen is only one of the 15 or 20 uh, um, chemical nutrients that, that actually go I into feeding plants. So the next big question is, is there a difference in yield between organic, organically fertilized land and minerally fertilized land? Because yield is very important when you're trying to feed these extra 2 billion people and the current 7 billion we currently have. And there's been a lot of studies done on this. And what we found is that, that in many cases, um, a, a pretty typical conventional yield is about 150 bushels, if you take a substance like corn, um, uh, about 150 bushels per acre. And in, when you really apply very, very best management practices organically, you can get very, very close to this, within 80 to 90%. And a lot of people put that forward as a win, and I think it's a great win too. But it doesn't tell the whole story, because you're comparing the very, very best of organic to pretty average conventional, and very often pretty average conventional 10 years ago. Because right now, the best farmers are e easily achieving 250 bushels per acre in a good year. And in fact, at Mosaic, we have a program called the Pursuit of 300, where we're working with some of our best farmers to try and get 300 bushels of corn per acre. When you get to these kinds of yields, organic isn't there yet. But it has made some great, great strides. The second issue I have with some of these studies that compare the yield in organic and, and um, uh, uh, conventional mineral fertilization is that the availability of organic matter is assumed. Now, if, you, if you're living here in Minnesota, you look out, look out the window, you see tons of organic matter everywhere. We, we live in a very lush place, plenty of water. The same is true in, in, in Iowa or, 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 or you know, Wisconsin. But you go to the plains in India, you're not going to find a lot of organic matter around. Now, I took this picture of this guy, and he was very, very upset, like basically lifting up his, his soil and going, this stuff is worthless. It's like sawdust. It'll grow nothing for me. And I looked around. He had one goat, and it was a very, very scrawny goat, not a very healthy looking goat, not going to produce a, lo a lot of manure. And really, except for some grasses and the residue from last year's extremely poor crop that, that basically didn't produce, that was all the organic matter he had. Even after applying all the organic matter, we tested the soils, and he was still woefully deficient in pretty much every single nutrient possible. So the availability of organic matter, you can't always assume. In fact, in many places of the world where we need to grow food, there is by no means near enough organic matter. In marginal soils, and when I say marginal, I mean soils that people still farm but probably shouldn't in an ideal world, um, it, it becomes even more dramatic. These two ears of corn were from the same seed, the same organic matter, basically scrambling to get everything they could get together in Uganda. But one had a capful of fertilizer added, and one didn't. 
And that was the difference in the two ears of corn on the two separate plots. And that's just ear size. The density and the, the actual number of crops that produced, there was just a, a dramatic difference. In fact, the difference between, between the two fields was almost one produced 10 times more than the other. So in marginal soils, uh, fertilization becomes even more important. Now, you can say, yeah, there's great yields there, there and, uh, and that's a great advantage, but what about all of the environmental um, disadvantages? What about runoff and the way nitrogen and phosphorus pollute our rivers? Well, there's no need for either nitrogen or phosphorus to pollute anything if we provide the right management practices. And the systems are there. In fact, many, many farmers are already following them, and more will follow them soon. There are some laggards, but we've got to work on those. But this is not a case of science, and this is not a case of the wrong product. This is a case of the wrong management practices, people not managing the right way. You've got to use the right type of fertilizer. You've got to test your soils and only use what's needed. You've got to apply it in the right amount. There's no, uh, no point in applying too much. It's just a waste of money. And if you apply too much nitrogen, it'll probably run off into, into the water supply. Phosphorus is different. Phosphorus doesn't run into the water supply the same way that nitrogen does. People often assume it does, but it doesn't. Phosphorus gets into water supply through soil erosion because phosphorus fixes in the soils. So when you're losing phosphorus into your water system, you're also losing your soil. And if you're a farmer, that's not a good thing. Your soil is extremely precious. So we really have to try and encourage more farmers to actually protect, protect th their own livelihoods, not lose their soil, and not lose phosphorus in the same way. We're also discovering that timing, the application of fertilizer, is vital when you're talking about environmental issues. And of course it is. Plants eat when they're hungry, the same way that humans eat when they're hungry. If you put fertilizer on, on, on the field, especially something like nitrogen, which is, a, which is naturally a gas and will want to get back to its gas state, if you leave it in the field for too long, there's a very good chance it'll run off. So timing your application is important. And the last part is applying fertilizers in the right part of the field. You don't want to apply them right by a water supply where they're more in danger of running in. So these are basic management practices which are being put forward by most agribusinesses these days. We just need to get greater adoption with farmers. So the big question, the $6 million question, can organics feed the world? Well, some of my most learned friends in this space tell me that's not a fair question. Really what we want is we want to mix the best practices of organic fertilizers and the best practices of mineral fertilizers and use them together. Because when you do that, that is our, our best and most ecologically sound solution. Maximize organic matter, but use crop nutrients where needed. And where you're going to find is most places will definitely, need, will definitely need a lot of crop nutrients for the simple reason is as we grow more food and all those nutrients go into the food so we can be nourished, you've got to replenish the soils afterwards. And soil management is extremely important because our soils are not going to have very much time to rest because we've got to produce as much food in the next 40 years as we have done in the last 10,000. So how does that mixture of organic and, and conventional work on a small farm where a farmer doesn't have very much knowledge. Well, we've been working with some farmers in Guatemala, and this particular gentleman is a, is a friend of mine. His name is Caruano de Lux Castro. He's a Mayan farmer. Traditional farmer only grows uh, um, uh, uh, corn with traditional Mayan seeds, old feedstock, not very productive seeds in comparison to, today, to today's hybrids, but they have religious significance for him. So he's not going to change his seeds. By simply teaching him how to maximize whatever organic matter he had, by using no-till agriculture and leaving the, the last year's crop residue on the ground so we can mix it in, organic matter is very, very important in, in creating conditions in the soil for, for water retention and texture in the soil. So by, by maximizing that organic matter and by adding one simple soda cap of fertilizer, we were able to take his yields at three to five, three to five time increase over his traditional yields in two years. So in two short years, he basically had a three to 500% increase depending on which plot we went to. It's, this is not rocket science. It's very, very simple to do. And in fact, the only tools we needed were, were a bamboo stake, a piece of twine to show him how to grow in, in, in rows, and a bottle cap to actually measure the fertilizer. What I'm hoping we will, we will do in general is if we achieve food literacy and begin to understand all the paradigms and how all these things to connect together, 
we'll get away from these big organic and, and, and conventional debates. And we'll, we'll begin to form our new sustainable ways, new forms of eco-agriculture, probably many, many different streams that will occur in this part of the world or that part of the world, depending on climactic conditions, farmer abilities, soils, etc. This food literacy, I really, really believe is important because right now major decisions are being made. And you, need to, you as consumers need to have a voice in those decisions. You can't simply rely on our policymakers to know what they're doing because quite often they honestly don't. There is all that noise out there. And I'll tell you, when I was fact checking all these facts here, I had a whole bunch of references so I could check each fact, but then I played a little game. Could I produce a whole bunch of references that would contradict this? And within about two hours, I had a whole bunch of studies that I could say, yes, contradicted every single thing I said. Now this isn't because I don't believe in science or science is confused. I actually very, very firmly believe in science. But The Economist wrote an article a few weeks ago on how science goes wrong. Now I did not agree with quite a bit of the things in that article because I really do believe science is, is not in crisis at all. However, there are so many articles being put forward, so many publications, the sheer volume means that not all of them are, are, are peer reviewed the same way they used to be. So there is a lot more disinformation out there, especially in the food space, than you would expect. You really have to be critical yourselves. You apply critical thinking and don't expect to get all your answers in, in one hour or two hours. It's going to take some time. This is a lifelong journey. You're going to be eating until the day you die. So that's the kind of food literacy I'm looking for. That's what I think we need to achieve. It's not about pumping up silly memes or, 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 or firing off a, 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 some quick comment to, to, to appear cool. It's about really looking at the facts, looking at all the paradigms. When you're looking at a study, try to see do they consider everything because this is a very, very complicated space and it's very, very easy to be food illiterate. So that's all I got for you today, but I'm willing to take as many questions as, as you have or engage in any kind of dialogue. We are, after all, trying to encourage dialogue and food literacy.